Welcome to this session of the Qualitative Methods Masterclass Webinar Series. This series of webinars is sponsored by International Institute for Qualitative Methodology, University of Alberta, and Atlas TI, Software for Qualitative Data Analysis. I am Neringa Kalpokaita, Manager of International Projects, Atlas TI, and I will just introduce a few concepts you need to know before this presentation. This presentation will be conducted through GoToWebinar, the system for web conferencing. If you happen to get disconnected from the session, you have to click again on the link received from GoToWebinar. If the presenter disconnects, he will do exactly the same thing. But in that case, please be patient. It may take a few minutes to him to come back. But of course, we hope that none of this will happen today and everything will go smoothly. We are very happy to announce that, that today we have with us Professor David Silverman, who will present for about 45 minutes, and after that, he will take questions. During the presentation, your microphones will be muted in order to avoid background noise and echo. But please feel free to write down all your questions and comments during his presentation using the control panel of GoToWebinar. In fact, you can try it right now. You can say hello in this control panel and I will read your questions. At the end of the presentation, I am going to read all your questions and I will pass the microphone to those who want to speak. And now I am going to give the microphone to Yvette McWatt, Program and Event Coordinator of International Institute for Qualitative Methodology, and she will introduce today's presenter. So, Yvette, I will give the microphone to you now. The microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Naringa. Professor David Silverman is Professor Emeritus in the Sociology Department at Goldsmith College London, visiting professor in the Management Department at King's College, University of London, and the Business School of University of Technology. Sydney, as well as adjunct professor at QUT Faculty of Education. He has authored 15 books and around 50 journal articles on qualitative research, ethnography, and conversation analysis. His most recent books include Doing Qualitative Research, Interpreting Qualitative Data, and a very short, fairly interesting, reasonably cheap book about qualitative research. He is the editor of Qualitative Research from SAGE. David Silverman, we're very happy to have you here with us today. Thank you, Yvette. And now, um, Professor Silverman, I'm going to meet you as a presenter. Uh, just give me a second. Um, let's convert you as a presenter and wait for a few seconds to make it happen. You should receive a message right now uh, saying if you want to share your screen. Did you receive it? I will open your microphone as well. Here you go. Professor Silverman, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, and did you receive a message saying would you like to share your computer screen? Yes. Fantastic. So now you are the presenter and the microphone is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk about the way in which interviews have come to dominate as a way of gathering data in qualitative research and why I think most of them are poorly analyzed. A lot of my uh, talk will be based upon a paper that uh, I, I wrote in qualitative research uh, last year. You'll see that its title, its main title was, how was it for you? And that's because I believe that one of the main questions that we think is most important to ask in qualitative research is how people see the world. But I also want to, this is the main question that so fascinates us in everyday life. And indeed, a lot of the social media is based upon asking and answering such questions. Um, excuse me, excuse me, Professor yes. Sutherland. Um, yes. We can't see your slides. Could you accept to become a presenter of this session? Yeah, I can't see how to. Okay, I will make you once again then. Let's see. It says if I'm not ready, I should click X in the top right hand corner. It doesn't say what else I'm supposed to do. Um, 
you should receive a message saying if you want to share your screen but i will try to give me a second i will see what can i do in order to resolve it yeah and once again i will make you as a presenter just right now you should receive a message uh, saying would you like to be a presenter do you see that I've, message i've got it okay so now you have to click on it and say yes Uh, is it working now? Mm, unfortunately not. Maybe I can try again to, to, to convert to you as a presenter. Let's try once again. Okay, so I'm inviting you to be a presenter once again. And uh, maybe you can minimize your PowerPoint slides before accepting to be a presenter. Maybe you have this message accepted to be a presenter behind your PowerPoint slides. Do you see the oh. message? Mm -hmm. I see the message, but I can't. I can't. I can't work. Out, I can't get a smaller screen to uh, to move my PowerPoint slides to. Mm. And if you click on Escape, on I don't know how, or just close. Uh, let, me, mm -hmm. let me try. I've clicked on Escape, and now it just put, puts up all the all my slides. Okay, and do you see the message received from yes, Google? I yes, see, I see the message, but I can't get rid of the message. Ah, but can can you say yes? Do you have an option, yes or no? <laughs> no, no. You you cannot. Okay, so I'm not sure what happens. Um, maybe what is the other solution we can find for that? Uh, maybe maybe I can um, convert you as an organizer. Um, uh, one question, could you send me your PowerPoint slides and I would open from my computer? It would that okay. be possible? Okay, so... Um, uh, uh, wait a minute, I need some paper to write down your address. Um, no, I, I will... Um, how can I make... I will send you a, a quick message from my email account in a second. So you will okay. have my, my email. Just uh, attach your PowerPoint slides and I will I will put from my computer, okay? Does that sound good? Okay. Okay, just give me one second. Okay, I just sent you a message. I said that it's me, so if you could attach the PowerPoint. It. Oh, great.
Okay, I just sent it. Okay, I will look for it. Okay, so here we go. I think that I have your first slide opened. Fantastic. So whenever you want, let's start and I will just, um, whenever you tell me, I will <laughs> click on the change, next slide. Change okay? the slide, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. In this talk, I'm going to be going through why uh, interviews are so much the default method in qualitative research methodology and why I think we should be more cautious about rushing to do interviews. And if we are going to use them, how we can improve our analysis of interview data. Next slide. Uh, the paper is based, the talk is based upon a paper that appeared last year. And it has its main title as, how was it for you? And the reason for having this as the title was that it seems to be the main reason why we are tempted to ask interviews is that we're so concerned with how other people see the but what's curious about this question how was it for you is that it's also the question that is central to our everyday life think of the importance of uh, social media where we're so concerned about hearing other people's experiences and telling them about our experiences so i want you to think about whether seeking to answer this question how was it for you is a research activity or much more likely an everyday activity and how we should be cautious about treating what is really an everyday activity as a research question next slide a lot of my work is presented in the in the books that yvette mentioned just before and i just draw your attention to doing qualitative research which is very much a phd primer based upon questions that PhD students have sent me when they attend my workshops and how I've answered those workshops. Next slide. Okay, let's think a little about the, the dominance of interviews in qualitative research. In my own research, I've hardly ever used interviews for reasons that will become apparent as I, as, as I talk. How then do I gather data? Well, I've gathered data largely by trying to get uh, inside uh, settings and obtaining recordings of what actually happens in those settings. And my, my preference is that I like to understand how people ordinarily do things without the interviewer questions based upon their own priorities, which may have an unknown relationship to the priorities of the participants. Another reason for wanting to use non-interview data is that I believe it's an area where the quantitative researchers are, in some senses, stronger than we are. After all, they can survey large random samples of interviewees, and they could use measures that are pre-tested, whereas often we're just interviewing half a dozen people, and our questions are, are, are not as well prepared as the quants questions. So in some senses, I find survey research often more convincing than qualitative research where it's based on interviews. Qualitative researchers are strongest, it seems to me, not on interviews, but on working with naturalistic data. Indeed, in many respects, naturalistic data is data that quant researchers can't get at, except through laboratory studies which change the way that the everyday world is constructed. Nonetheless, despite these issues, when I come to teach PhD students, I find roughly between eight and nine out of ten of them have a strong preference for doing gathering their data through interviews. And this occurs across disciplines, it occurs across countries, it seems to be a universal feature. And this is hardly surprising since many of their supervisors also have a preference for interview data and, and work with it. Next slide. Now, this preference for interview data doesn't fit with what one of the dominant uh, handbooks of qualitative research argues. And in this slide, you see that by Denzin and Lincoln, 
you see the argument being made by them that qualitative research shouldn't privilege one particular way of doing uh, research, of gathering data. But actually, this statement of Denson and Lincoln's, which I, with which I fully agree, is not how qualitative research actually works. If you look at it, if you look at most qualitative journals, next slide, uh, what do they have? A preference for publishing papers based on interview data. I did a survey of a journal some years ago, uh, over a couple of years, and noticed that of the 18 research articles they published in this period, fully 16 of them used interviews, one used another kind of non-naturalistic data focus group, and only one used naturalistic data documents, data, naturalistic data being data that would have been there even if the, there had been no researcher involved that happened. There's a journal where things happened. Next slide. Now, what are the bad features of this preference for interview data? And more importantly, how interview data is routinely analyzed? Firstly, I feel a lot of interview data that we read about in journals as well as in PhD thesis is poorly transcribed. One instance of this is the way in which so much of the transcripts that we find are punctuated. It's almost as if people spoke, spoke in full stops and commas. What does that miss out? It misses out the pauses, the ahams, and so on of ordinary interaction. Why do these matter? Well, actually, I'd argue we make sense of each other's talk in a large way through features like pauses, uh, overlaps, and so on, and um -hums. So a lot of interview data is poorly transcribed. So we're trying to do analysis on material that actually is a pure, poor reflection of how people are actually talking. Secondly, if you look at a lot of journal articles, what we find there are simply one line extracts, often prefaced by a very telling observation. One interesting example of this was. Now, whenever I read one interesting example of this was in a piece of research, I start to worry. The reason being is using that as an introduction to a piece of data is an ideal opportunity to bring in something that supports what it is you want to show. And remember, what we should be doing in research is being very critical and skeptical of the claims which other people are trying to make. We don't want, we shouldn't be searching for illustrations. We should be searching for much more credible basis for making claims. Yet so much interview, the pre, pre, so much presentation of interview data is anecdotal uh, and just gives us examples to illustrate the claims that researcher is, is making. So why should we believe the researcher? A third reason why I am skeptical about a lot of the claims that uh, interview researchers make is that so often when they report uh, extracts from the data, they did leak what the interviewer is doing. We only have what the interviewee has said. So we don't know what has preceded whatever the, whatever the interviewee is reported as having said. We don't know if it's, if it's a question, if so, what kind of question the interviewer has asked. We don't know if it follows a, 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 a pause or a hmm from the interviewer. And all of these things are actually, have been proved to be actually very con um, consequential for the understanding of an interviewee. And finally, a fourth problem that I have with so, man so many of the ways in which interview data is analyzed is that we simply treat what interviewees say as being a direct entrance into their consciousness, as if somehow the, uh, the good interviewer has put themselves on one side, has just managed to burrow into the brains of the interviewee. Why do I think that makes interviewees into dopes? Well, it turns out that when we're responding to things that the interviewer is doing, we're doing many more things than answering questions. For instance, 
when I've looked at some interview data that other people have gathered, I see that one of the things that people do is attend to the way in which the answer they want to give might not fully fit with the expectations built into the interviewer's questions. And actually, it turns out interviewees are very clever in the way they handle this. So it turns out when they want to make a counterintuitive answer to, to a question, an answer that the interviewer wasn't expecting, they put in something that we might call a preface, to, which makes it clear to the interviewer that they can see why the interviewer might have asked that question, but at the same time, at the same time points out that they're going to go in a rather different question. And amazingly, interviewers, interviewees do this sort of thing, letting them talk, without any kind of training at all. They're not dopes, and yet they achieve all these kinds of features in their, in, in their interaction without any training. And yet we assume that interviewers need training and interviewees don't. Now, all of this suggests that actually interviews as interactions are much more complicated things than so many interview researchers assume. Next slide. Another kind of feature you find in so many quality is that after we have usually a short extract from what an interviewee has said, we get in brackets certain kinds of features uh, of these people. We've given some information about these people. And the next, this slide illustrates from three different studies what we are told about an interviewee. So in this example, we're told we're given a woman's name, we know it's female, we're given her age, and we're given her In another study, again, we're given a name, indicating the person is male in this case, we're given age. In this case, we're given their marital status and the number of children they have. And in a final study, we're given uh, the number of people interviewed, but also their occupation, their gender, and their age. Well, what's problematic about this, you might say? Isn't this uh, useful in information? Well, two things about this. Firstly, it's making uh, an assumption that the researcher is the best place to tell us what are the crucial features of the background of each of the interviewer, interviewees that they are interviewing. Well, what's problematic about that? Well, if you think about it, just take yourself, you could be identified through any number of these classifications. And the question to be asked is, why is the researcher picking out these features and not others? So, for instance, we're told age, gender, maybe occupation. Why aren't we told things like what their leisure habits are? Or other features that are important to them, but not being told by the researcher. In fact, what I argue what the researcher is doing is trying to make us see these interviewees in terms which she wants us to see them in. So the researcher is making a choice about from an endless list of categories, want to, making us want to see the interviewee as a certain kind of person. The second problem with this is if you just take gender, for instance, the researcher has identified in each of these research studies. To me, it was a much more interesting question than what the, how the researcher identifies an interviewee's gender, which is what work, if any, the interviewee does with their gender. In other words, do they bring it in to how they formulate uh, themselves? As a qualitative researcher, I'm not so much interested in what objectively, in some sense, gender is, I'm interested in how the participants go about constructing gender. And there's a final problem about this, that if the qualitative researcher is wanting to make claims about what the interviewee is saying in relationship to their position in society, they're doing something which, is, which essentially quantitative researchers could do much better. Because after all, if you think about it, what quantitative research is about, in part, is about correlating one's position in society to what one does. And as I've said already, quantitative researchers can work with large samples and so can get a much better picture of the relationship between one's place in society and what one says. 
So what, what, what the qualitative researcher is doing by pulling out a few features of uh, people's identity is into a competition with quantitative researchers, which quantitative researchers must do better than, than they do. It's a game they must lose. So why play this game at all? So I would prefer it if interview researchers doing qualitative research, particularly from a constructionist viewpoint, didn't give us these snapshots and instead focused attention on the identities that the participants, the interviewees, were actually making claim to, not what the researchers were making claim to. Next slide. Carrying on this critique of how uh, interview research is largely done, I've already referred to the issue of the, the short extracts that so many interview uh, uh, researchers use. What this means is there's no attempt in many inter uh, published interview papers to analyze the data set at all, uh, overall, the whole data set. So we, we just get small extracts and we don't know how these extracts relate to um, the, all the data that they have. Towards the end of this talk, I'll show you one way of trying to survey your data set as a whole in a better way of doing uh, qualitative interview studies. A second problem, which follows from the first, is it's very rare in most uh, interview studies to find deviant cases mentioned, which threaten the claims that the interview researcher is trying to make. You don't get the sense they've hunted down cases that don't fit with their analysis. You get much more the sense that they're just giving you, as I've said already, interesting examples that fit the arguments that they want to make. And this is hardly scientific. If you think about Popper and the philosophy of science, what we should be trying to do is refute our initial hypotheses, not find just supporting for a hypothesis. And a third problem that uh, sometimes arises in poor uh, qualitative interview research is the researchers bases their research on by posing the research question to the participants. Now, two things about that. Firstly, how easy it would be to do research if all research consisted of dreaming up a research question, going along to ask a few people uh, this question, and then writing down what they say. Now, I want you to think if that's really serious uh, research of any kind. Moreover, quant researchers are aware of the way in which you shape people's presuppositions uh, by asking them the direct, direct questions. And so uh, they, they build in ways of getting around that. Unfortunately, a lot of researchers, particularly beginning uh, researchers, are unaware of these kinds of issues. Next slide. I just want to give you one, before I get on to how you can do better qualitative interview research, because I appreciate many of my listeners may be using interview uh, uh, methods. Before I do so, let me just give you one final example of where I think you can go wrong in uh, qualitative interviews. And it's a study of uh, stalkers. And next slide. And I want to look at how in this study, and I'll give you the reference to it in a minute, I think interviews are poorly used. And I want to show you the way in which I think what's going on here is an analysis that claims to be social research, but instead draws upon very many common sense assumptions about the world. Uh, it's, it's a quite old study by the, the authors of Johnson and Rowlands. And this is how they, Johnson and Rowlands, set up what they're trying to do. They want to see how who stalk interpret their actions and find out, try and find out the emotions, as they put it, that lie underneath those actions. Now let's think about this as a social research project. Next slide. Johnson and Rowlands talk about stalkers' conflicted emotions. Now, to me, is the idea that people have conflicting emotions 
a social scientific idea or is it a common sense idea? The idea, first thing that emotions lie behind every kind of activity is part, once again, of the everyday world seen in social media. What is the scientific evidence for that? At the same time, it makes stalkers, much as I, like you, no doubt, uh, reject what stalkers do, assume that stalkers are dopes. It assumes that what they're going to tell the interviewer about their stalking activity is consistent with what they, are all, what they actually have done. Whereas I'd like to suggest to you that stalkers, just as all of us, when we have to talk about our activity, will shape our account of it according to the audience to whom we're talking. So I would suggest that stalkers would talk about their behavior in one way to uh, a social scientific interviewer, in another way uh, when they're, if, they're, if they're arrested, in another way when they're brought to trial, in another way if they come across a psychiatrist or, other, or counselor and so on, another way to their family members who may be horrified of, to hear what they've done. In other words, people are just, there is no meaning of an activity. There are instead recipient bound ways that we have of cleverer than these researchers assume we are. So it seems to me these researchers are using the everyday language and common sense reasoning, not of social scientists, but of counselors or media reporters. They're making the mistake of assuming that stalkers as interviewees are dopes who are going to tell them the real truth underlying their behavior. And why indeed should we assume that there is a single motive or meaning behind uh, any activity, even an activity as apparently deviant as stalking? People often act and only find the meaning of it afterwards when they're brought to account. Most of the time, action occurs where, without reference to its meaning. We just do things. And only if we're asked or brought to account do me does a meaning arise. And this is why I say, uh, following the work of Alfred Schutz, the thing we should be doing, which distinguishes us from this kind of what seems to me simplistic work, is rather than using common sense reasoning, as they do, to, to study an activity, we should be studying common sense reasoning in its complexity. Next slide. So often then, interview, poor interview researchers are making claims about indiv individuals. They're seeing interviews as a way of getting inside the head of their interviewees to find the single meaning behind their actions. And so I put a question mark around using open-ended interviews to access people's perceptions and attitudes. Once again, it draws on the common sense assumption that, that inside our head are a whole set of perceptions and attitudes about the, about the world. And it's really simplistic to assume that good researchers can bore inside our heads to find what these perceptions and attitudes are. A lot of the time, we don't, th as I said already, we don't think about the world in this kind of way. We, ju we, we just act. Moreover, what kind of researchers, if we say that perceptions and attitudes are an important topic, what kind of researchers are best placed to discover these perceptions and attitudes? Surely survey researchers and quantitative researchers. So in making perceptions and attitudes our topic, we're in a contest with quantitative research, whereas I've said already, the quantitative researchers can do better than we can. Surely it's much better to research as being about different kinds of features of the world. So why not survey if this is what we want to do? And I'd argue that where we're different and can be better than quantitative researchers, as quantitative researchers, uh, are often prepared to re recognize is to study actual social processes. Rather than trying to get inside people's heads, to study social processes which are unavailable to uh, so much quantitative research. Next slide. The final point I'd like you to think about before I get on to 
uh, how we can improve the quality of qualitative interviews is just think about the different ways in which we of the world depending upon who we're speaking to, the audience that's receiving our account. Let's take some examples of that. So in an interview, we're making while talking to a researcher and being responsive to what may be the researcher's needs and questions. Now, how different might that be when we talk about the same events or ourselves to a work colleague? And how different might that be when we have to make, say, a formal presentation, for instance, at a company meeting? And how different that might be when organizations prepare documents for shareholders. And indeed, how different all four of these things might be when one might describe one's day to a partner. So what I'm trying to say here is there is no single account of waiting uh, inside our heads for the researcher to unearth. Instead, what we need to be paying attention to is the different way in which people uh, organize and recipient design their talk for different kinds of audiences. And too often simplistic interview research assumes there is a single meaning which the, which the empathetic uh, researcher can discover. The final example on this slide is the way in which particular occupations who have to do reports on how people see the world uh, might uh, constitute those reports. So the way in which social workers might talk about an individual, lawyers. So all, all we have here in these six examples are of the way in which accounts occur in a variety of contexts. And there is no single account uh, which does justice to what somebody means. Okay, I now want to move to a more optimistic note to show you those of you, indeed, no doubt the majority of you who are seeking to use interview data, the ways in which it seems to me you, you can use that in a more worthwhile uh, manner. Let me give you a few examples of students that, uh, who, who've uh, been in workshops that I've run, who've written to me about their research who would want to do interview research, but pose their research question in a non-common sense way, which fits the kind of constructionist model of qualitative research, which I like. Here's the first example. It comes from a very uh, sad situation of um, parents who have lost their child. And it's a study by Katerin in Finland. Now notice how she's formulated her research question, not what is the experience of losing uh, a baby, which might be the topic I'd like you to think and realize, might be the topic of something we might re read in a magazine or see online, but would be an everyday question we could ask, indeed, of, obviously about a tragic situation. Notice that Catherine is not concerned with this, not concerned with re common sense questions, as I would put it, but asking a non-common sense question. How do you go about telling such a story about after the death of a, of a child? And this is not just something um, to, to, not to trivialize this issue, because if you think about it, family members in tragic situations have to construct stories to other family members uh, and, uh, and other other groups, counselors, and so on, about what it was like. And if we can understand more about the construction of these stories, this could have practical benefits. Here's a second example from a student. Stephen in the UK was doing, had a rather incestuous topic. He was a postgraduate himself, but he was studying um, postgraduate life. But look how it formulates his research question. Not what is it, what is the experience of postgraduate life like, but rather of postgraduate life are discursively constructed and sustained by postgraduates in interviews about doing their PhDs. And here's a final example from Sveinung in Norway. 
taking a risk going out on the street streets interviewing drug users and dealers but look here unlike a magazine article or an online article using common sense categories Sveinung is concerned with the version how drug users and dealers present versions of themselves uh, in these interviews not trying to get the truth which is really inside their heads as it were but rather looking at how their recipient designing their stories to convince him of uh, that they should that he should respect them in the course of these interviews next slide let me suggest a number of th further things that you could do in uh, using interviews and now I'll, I'll move on through how you formulate your research topic to kinds of things you should be looking for in your data analysis data analysis after all is, is crucial uh, in all research particularly so in qualitative research much more so I might add as I add, say in my books than literature reviews uh, methodology chapters and the rest what really counts is the quality of your data analysis how then to improve the quality of your uh, interview data analysis some things to look for when your interviewee uses phrases like speaking as a woman or wearing my professional hat this is rich data indeed because you haven't given them an identity remember the identities in brackets i was talking about earlier uh, where the researcher assigns an identity to the interviewee the interviewee has actually invoked that's gold dust for you and it's a gold dust for you in terms of where when and how they invoke that identity there's no meaning in a single term but look at when and where they're invoking it and what what function it serves in the course of their talk so one thing to look for is signaling identities. Another thing to look for, something I've mentioned already, are prefaces. Not just, don't treat what interviewees say just as an answer to a question. But look how they formulate that answer. One of the things you'll often find is prefaces. Prefaces often come in where the interviewee wants to produce a counterintuitive or unexpected answer, or perhaps express better, wants to define what they're saying as counterintuitive or unexpected. Prefaces are also lovely data in your interviewee's talk. Warrants are fascinating. What do I mean by a warrant? A warrant is where an interviewee puts in some kind of justification for what they've just said or what they're about to say. Let me give you an example of that. When I was looking through interviews uh, with uh, managers who'd kept their jobs when a lot of their colleagues had lost their jobs, I found that a couple of them used the word lucky. Now, my interest in this was not just the word lucky, although that's interesting in itself, but where they used, where they positioned that word in the course of their account. And what it turned out was that both of them positioned lucky so they made a statement which could be heard as a criticism of their colleagues who'd lost their jobs where they to mark what they said as potentially being hearable as boasting and the beauty of lucky is that it takes the, the sting out of um, the possible charge that they were boastful because then it makes it clear that actually the same thing might have happened to them they were lucky so look for such warrants again like signaling identities they're gold dust but don't just count where the number of times they appear but look what work they are doing what function they serve in the position positions in which they occur next slide and a few more practical suggestions try and improve your transcription one way to get a better transcript is to have some i don't mean um just a, a, a an audio typist but i do mean uh, a fellow researcher who's also working with interview data believe me you'll miss things in your in your recordings uh, unless you get somebody else to work on them and they'll and if you do it for them 
um, they'll do it for you. So try and find peers to work on your improving your transcripts. Try and avoid trying to explain what people are saying by what you know about their identity. You'll recall that most interview transcripts have an identity on the left hand side and then the comments of the interviewee on the right hand side. What I mean by a right left analysis is rather than reading off the meaning of what people are saying by the identity on the left hand side of the page, you look at how they invoke various identities in the course of their talk, where they invoke them, and use that to understand the identities they're giving you. What matters is the identities that the participants evoke, not ones which you invoke. The third feature I want to talk about is even more counterintuitive. What I suggest you do is obviously at the start, you're going to read down a transcript, read down a page. But then rather than trying to interpret it on a phrase by phrase or line by line basis, go down it and try and find something, some product in the talk, something that some topic or something that's achieved in the talk and then work back to see how it's been produced by the participants. And the beauty of proceeding in this way, not only is it non-commonsensical and counterintuitive, what it does is actually look at how the participants are producing some kind of meaning in the talk rather than you interpreting a meaning on each single line because that could be endless we could have endless discussions about what people really mean and there's no way of choosing between them the fourth feature i've already talked about always look for the co-construction of identities between the interviewer and the interviewee rather than the given identities that are that you may be tempted to put in brackets or on the left hand side of the page uh, uh, at the side of what an interviewee says or an interviewer says the final briefly talk about and that will conclude my talk is a more critical way of analyzing your data than is often done Remember I was talking about deviant cases earlier? Well, what I'm suggesting you do is begin with intensive analysis of say one or two interviews. Try and work out what's going on. I've given you some clues that, that you could follow uh, to, about the sort of things to look for. And the aim here is to try and produce a hypothesis. That's the point of intensive analysis on a limited amount of data. You then go on to look at your data set as a whole five, six, however many interviews you've done, and to see how far that hypothesis uh, is maintained throughout. Whatever process you've noted in the data, does it occur? Does it occur in the same way? And this I call extensive analysis. And the point of extensive analysis is to try and identify deviant cases and then modify your analysis in the light of those deviant cases. This is a critical way of proceeding. We're not proceeding by one interesting example of this is, we're looking for deviant cases. And finally, having found those deviant what you can do is go, go through intensive analysis of those deviant cases to see if your initial hypothesis uh, holds. So those are a number of uh, uh, practical suggestions. I want to conclude by giving an example uh, from a, a PhD I supervised many years ago, uh, Jeffrey Baruch, who was interviewing parents of children with congenital heart disease. And in analyzing this data, he tried to be critical. He tried not to rush to conclusions. And he tried to be critical by doing extensive analysis where he tabulated many cases and investigated deviant cases. Next slide. Here's an example of um, one interview that he did. And you'll see this is poorly transcribed. Uh, it's punctuated. I, I want to show it to you, not from the point of view of its transcription, but from the point of view of uh, the kind of claims this parent of a sick child is making. Notice how she, um, who identifies his mother, um, she talks about worrying about her first child in her first turn. The interviewer says, mm-hmm, 
and she continues um, the way in which her worries were not supported by the nurses when she took her child to the clinic. Uh, they, she reports and they said, you're just making yourself worrying unnecessarily, uh, you see. Uh, the kind of, and, and Baruch found that this kind of story was recurrent in the interviews that he was doing. He did 20 interviews with um, th these parents. They told stories which emphasized how they were taking on responsibility making efforts in relationship to their child and counterintuitive to what we expected jeffrey asked the question of these mothers you know tell me the story of your child and we expected we'd get something like a medical history we hardly ever got that and i'll give you one example where we did but for the moment nearly all of these cases in 19 out of the 20 we've got a story of not of the child's medical history but what of what the mother herself had done now this was a hypothesis he talked about what you what they were getting here was essentially a moral tale how could he know whether this held throughout his data set as a whole next slide to get us to start to do this extensive analysis of his 20 interviews he used a simple way of analyzing um, what these mothers were saying, looking at the identities they invoked and who was taking action and with whom they were taking the action. Let's call these membership categories. So one pair of membership categories was the parent taking the action for their child. You see that in the interview we just looked at. Another pair was the parent taking action in relationship to professional. You've seen that too in the interview extract. A third paired category was a professional, say a doctor or nurse, taking action towards a child. And a fourth category, paired category, was a professional taking action towards a parent. And he counted in each of these interviews the number of times these paired membership categories arose and you'd find multiple pairs in any one story so there's no simple one-to-one -one relationship between any single interview and any pair and this is with the num these are the numbers he found and in brief what this illustrates if you look at the top number 160 out of 311 paired categories involved the parent taking action for their child add in the 86 uh, the parent taking action in relationship to a professional and you get the vast number of these paired categories were making the parent the major actor okay so he supported the hypothesis but remember i said the point of extensive analysis is to find deviant case and sure enough he found one deviant case next slide this was you where the interviewees talked about their child and their uh, what had happened to them in terms of a medical history and i've given the game away already because this couple were both pharmacists health professionals themselves and they chosen to use that identity as a way of telling their story the other parents who didn't weren't health professionals didn't have these identities uh, available to use in their story. So we didn't feel this deviant case distracted from the main analysis. So we've moved from intensive analysis from a single case to extensive analysis of our data set as a whole, identified a data uh, deviant case, but nonetheless, our analysis and hypothesis seem to be uh, supported. To conclude, what I've been trying to say to you fo follows what um, Potter and Hepburn say next slide this is say in the, this quote we need us when treating interview talk as a way of referring to inner psychological objects of some kind and that's essentially what lies behind my critique of so much interview data that when we treat what people say as a reflection of their inner states we're doing something that's going on in the the world around us we don't have to be researchers to do this it's going on in social media it's going on in uh, counseling interviews 
It's going on in all kinds of interviews out there in the world. Think carefully before you use a research interview is the same, in the same way in everyday life. Research and everyday life, after all, should be different kinds of activities. Final slide. So I'm saying to you, if you're tempted to use interviews, reflect upon your choice of interviews. Maybe you're using an interview simply because interviews seem to be so prevalent in the world in which we live, and you haven't thought about other ways of gathering data. And if you're well advanced in an interview study, the last thing I want to say is start again. But maybe this talk may help you to reflect more on your methodology, and you can include, I would hope, some of the discussion uh, that I've been offering you in your methodology chapter. And if you're doing interview data, please try and do better interview analysis than is so prevalent on in, even in the journal articles that we read, where we, people simply report what people say um, as simply a reflection of their inner states and don't understand the way in which people actually tell stories in different ways to different groups. And finally, and this is really my final observation, if you're starting out, do please think about about the possibility of not using interview data or other manufactured data like focus groups. Think about the possibility of using naturalistic data, data that would be out there anyway without the researcher's intervention. Of course, no data is ultimately untouched by human hands, but nonetheless, there can be more or less naturalistic data. And if you say, well, I'd like to use naturalistic data, but I'm not able to, for instance, I'd like to get inside an organization and study it, but I can't get access, well, then work with naturalistic data that's easier to get access to, like, like documents, like uh, analyzing uh, social media, like, like company reports, um, which are out there and available for analysis and even more beautiful. Uh, we can have them on day one so we can concentrate on data analysis uh, rather than spending ages on gathering our data. That concludes my talk and I'd be very interested to receive your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Silverman, for your uh, brilliant presentation. Definitely is one of the most uh, inspiring presentations I have ever attended. So uh, thank you very much. And right now we have maybe just a few minutes, uh, five more minutes to, to talk to, to you participants. You can raise your questions, ask questions, and Professor Silverman will be pleased to answer. So how we are going to proceed from now? If you have a question, what you have to do, you just have to click on the hand icon that you will find on the control panel of GoToWebinar, and I will open your microphone. So you will be able to, to ask your question um, to the Professor Silverman right now. Let's see if we have some um, hands rising. Wendy, Wendy, here you are. I see that you have a question, so I will open your microphone. Give me a second. Uh, your microphone, now it's opened, but I see that you have muted yourself. Could you unmute your microphone, please, Wendy? Let me see if she can unmute her microphone, and uh, meanwhile, I will see if we have some written questions. Okay, and uh, Wendy, she wrote, uh, can you elaborate on studying social processes? Uh, this is what she's asking, and uh, yeah. Um, Wendy says, I, I'm sitting where I can't unmute myself, so she has a question. Can you elaborate on studying social processes, Professor Silverman? Yes, let me take an example from my own recent research on HIV test counselling. Now, if I'd done an interview study on that, I'd have asked uh, counsellors and their clients what they were trying to achieve and whether they thought they achieved it in the um, consultation. A social process would be to study, as I try to do, what was actually going on in these counselling sessions, how they, the counsellors were packaging advice and how the way in which they packaged advice was being received. So social processes involve studying actual um, the, the, 
the actual interaction between participants, if you're looking at what participants are doing, or if you're looking at apparently inert material like, uh, like documents, it, to realize that it's not inert, social processes would consist in, in, in documents, in, in how they were organized to tell a particular kind of story. So when we study social processes, we're not concerned with getting inside the heads of people, we're looking at what they are doing. Thank you very much. And now we have another person whose name is Jonathan Mathers. Jonathan Mathers uh, has a question. So Jonathan, uh, I'm going to open your microphone so you will be able to ask your question. Uh, the microphone is unmuted. Jonathan? Hello? No, uh, Jonathan says that has no microphone. Okay, but uh, the question is, do you not believe that constructed interview accounts have anything about underlying experience psychological processes? Well, I don't, um, because uh, to me that's that's a common sense assumption um, to see what we what we say as reflecting the grey matter uh, inside our heads. Uh, moreover, um, as I've said already, it it makes what we say and do uh, makes us into dopes who are simply just reflecting what's inside our heads in the answers that we give. All the studies of language with which I'm familiar shows that language is much more complicated than that and that we shouldn't reduce language and social interaction to uh, what is inside our heads. And the last question we have from Timothy. Uh, I see that uh, the person raised his hand, so I will open your microphone, Timothy, and then we will close the session. The microphone is yours, Timothy. Would you mind to unmute your microphone? I, s I open your microphone, so yeah, now you can talk. Okay, uh, I have a quantitative research, so I'm a researcher, so I'm learning a lot here. Um, and I, I, I realize that I think I'm, I'm what I actually intend to do is not true uh, qualitative research. So I wanted to know your thoughts on using interviews basically as surveys for which we don't have validated questions yet. And so we're not quite sure what to ask and to determining determine those questions uh, with a more open forum that, that uh, interviews allow for more quantitative questions. Uh, well, two things about that. I'd say, firstly, uh, your question probably would be better answered by a quantum because you know, they'd be aware of the, you know, the limits of asking questions where there are you know, no pre-tested questions. But the second thing I would say within qualitative research is actually I don't believe there's any better way of asking a question. Whatever you, however you ask the question is going to impact on the answer you're going to give. So what I draw from that is that uh, what, what we should be studying is the co-construction of meaning between the interviewer and the interviewee rather than just treating whatever the uh, interviewee says as uh, a good or bad reflection of, of how they see things. So there's really no time out for social interaction and you know how, even just saying um, tell me a story which seems to be about the tell me your story seems to be the most open-ended question you could ask uh, you're going to get a narrative because you've asked for a story. So there's no, there are no good or bad questions from the, that I was suggesting. The important thing is whatever questions you ask or whatever other interactions you engage in during the interview, analyze how that is shaping the answers that the uh, interviewee is giving. Thank you very much, Professor Silverman. So it, it seems that we are... Uh, obligated to start finishing our presentation today and uh, I want to thank you very much Professor Silverman for your amazing insights and for making us think and reflect about interviews and um, right now I would like to give the microphone to Yvette just to maybe to make a few announcements and say goodbye before we finish this meeting. Yvette would you like to say goodbye? 
Thank you very much, Naringa, and thank you very much, David, for that wonderful presentation. Um, thank all of you for coming um, to this webinar series. Without you, it would not be possible. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to join us next month, July 26th at 1 p.m. Laura L. Ellingson will be speaking on the embodiment in qualitative research. So registration is up on the IIQM site, and hopefully we'll see you next month. Thank you very much, Yvette. And uh, from my side, what I would like to invite you all those who are using Atlas DI to visit our website, especially free training section, because we provide many different webinars on Atlas DI, how to do literature review with Atlas DI and so on. So if anybody wants to learn Atlas DI, we offer every week free webinars. You can go on the website and learn more about that. And finally, what I would like to ask the Professor Silverman, maybe you would like to say a few more things before saying goodbye? The final thing I'd, I'd like to do is just stress that I, maybe many of you in my audience will already be using interviews uh, in your research. And the last thing I want you to do is to, to stop what you're doing and, and start again. So at best, what I would like you to take away, if, you, if you'd be prepared to, is just to reflect upon the reasons why you've chosen interviews, and also to reflect upon what you, how you might have done things differently if you'd used more naturalistic data. So in any event, discuss this with your supervisors if you have, have, have supervisors and recognize, actually, one other thing you might recognize is if you take seriously any of what I've been saying, there's quite a low bar in qualitative research. The standard of a lot of qualitative research doesn't live up always to the standards of scientific rigor. And treat that if you want to do qualitative research as an encouragement, because you know you don't have to jump so high to do really good work. So I wish you all good luck. Definitely, thank you very much, Professor Silverman, and thank you all for participating in this webinar. Definitely, as Yvette said, it's really important your participation to make this series successful. And we look forward to seeing all of you in our future events of this webinar series. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Good luck. Bye.